right. Good afternoon, or good morning, everyone. Afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. My name is Nick Narzinski with D3 Technologies, and today we're going to go over a webinar for HSM Cam. Um, if somebody could just chat in and let me know that you guys can hear me okay. That way we <clears throat> I don't want to keep going on if nobody can hear me. So once we get confirmation here. Okay. Looks like we're good to go. So, as I said, uh, we're going to go over the HSM software here integrated into Inventor. And we've got about 20 minutes, so I should be wrapping this up about 11.50, let you guys get to your lunch. If anyone has any questions, feel free to chat in as I'm going through this. And I'll give my contact information at the end, and you guys can also email or call me if you need to get a hold of me. So. Um, here we can see Inventor, for those of you familiar with it. This is an assembly. I've got a part file placed in here twice. And basically what I'm going to do is just run through how we would set this part up and add the operations to it, and then we can post the code out. So once you're done modeling, and you don't have to do an assembly here, I put it into an assembly. That way, whenever we do our simulation to verify the cutting profile, we can also take into account the fixed ring and any clamps that we have in there into account for uh, collision detection. So the first thing we're going to do is a job setup. So up here on the ribbon, typically you'd be here in assembly or if I open this part up and was working on the part file, you'd be in the 3D model tab. Once you get finished, you'd simply move over to the CAM tab or in the assembly, move over to the CAM tab. So you can see it's integrated. And then we're ready to start adding our job setup. So initially, and you see the browser here changes for the setup. Initially, it's going to find the outer limits of the entire assembly or part file if you're working with a part file. So what I want to do is decide which model we're actually going to be working with. So I'm going to select the model here in the browser and choose the model on the window. And then you see that the stock size shows up of that part file. Next thing I want to do is reorient my work coordinate system because as you can see, right now it is matching the model's work coordinate system. So, you know, a lot of times we get files from customers and we don't model them up with the Z in the correct orientation for how we're going to machine it. So they give us a real easy method of reorienting that. Simply select the stem of the Z axis and then you can select an edge you want it parallel to or a surface you want it perpendicular to. So I'm just going to select this top surface and then notice the orient towards the spindle. Next thing I want to do is move that work coordinate system to my 0, 0, 0 point. So I'm going to select this triad or this gray ball at the 0, 0, 0 point. And as soon as I do, you notice the ed or end points and midpoints of all the edges of that stock uh, become selectable. On the browser, we also have the ability to select model origin, or we can even do a selected point. I can pick a point on the vise for a non-movable jaw. That way it's the same for any part that you place in there. So you can always reference the same point. But for this exercise, I'm just going to simply select the midpoint of the top of the stock. And on the stock tab, here's where we define the actual size and shape of the stock that we're working with. So we have five different types. We have fixed box size, relative box size, uh, fixed cylinder, and relative cylinder, and then also from solid. So fixed size is just you can enter your length, width, and height, or for cylinder, it would be the diameter and the length. And then relative box size is relative to the model. So as soon as I switch to relative, you notice the stock size shrunk down to the outer limits of my model. So what you can then do is just add on to the extent of it. So I'm going to throw on a quarter inch to the bottom of the part. You see that part grow or the stock size grows, and we have something to grab onto with that with the device. Now, if you look down at the bottom, based off of the dimensions of the model and the extents I've added, we see our dimensions come out to be 4.08, 1.83, and 0.79. I don't think too many guys in the shop want to cut to those dimensions, so they give us a nice round up to nearest box here, and I can just put in an eighth inch, and it will round those numbers to that. The last tab for post-processing, this is where we can set up multiple work coordinate offsets. Um, your 0 and 1 right here are going to be G54, 
if you have multiple vices in your um, CNC mill, you can check the box for that, enter how many you have, and then you can actually preserve your operations for this one part on each vice by order, operation, or tool. So, for instance, if you're using a face mill to um, shave off the material down to the top of the model there, you can do that on all four vices before you switch to an end mill to a start machine and out. So, I'm going to put one here for G54 and I'm going to OK this. So we now see we have a setup here in the browser and we're ready to start adding our operations. So the first one I'm going to do is face that material off. I'm going to come into a facing operation. And one of the nice things about the software is all the operations have the same five tabs listed here in the browser. The only one that's a little bit different is drilling. That one has a cycle tab instead of linking and passes. So back to the face operation. You can see the difference there. But all the other operations, the same five tabs. So learning the software, pretty easy to go to pick up on things. You know where to go for picking the tool, for geometry, and so on and so forth. But the workflow, the first thing you're going to do is select the tool. So I hit tool, and it opens up my tool library. And the first thing you're going to notice is I already have some parts in here. And if you look on the left side here, this is the actual part files I have open in my browser. What's on the right is the tools that have been saved in here. So what this is telling me, the tools are actually saved directly into the part file, as well as all the operations that we're adding. So there's no importing or exporting of files. It's all being done directly on the file that you're working with. And I put these tools in here just for the sake of this um, presentation, so I'm not having to go through. but. There is a bunch of different tools that come with the software if you need to go out into the library and find them. And creating a tool is very easy as well. You can come in the new mill tool, pick the cutter type, and your inputs change depending on the type of that you're creating. So I'm going to select the one and three quarter inch end mill that I have here. And I'm just simply going to right click, and you notice we have the marking menu that you are used to using in Inventor, and select OK. By default, facing operations know to come down and lead in outside the stock, and it's going to make its passes on the top of the model. So as you can see, if I look at this at an angle, we're coming down outside the stock. It's going to lead in and make the correct number of passes depending on the size of the stock and the diameter of your tool. Now, obviously, if you need to, you can come in and add step downs or change your step over. Any of those options are available as well. Um, the next thing I want to do is rough out the inside of these pockets. I'm going to use a high-speed milling operation known as adaptive clearing. So here we have 2D adaptive. And again, first thing I'm going to do is come into my tool library and select quarter-inch end mill. And then I'm going to move on to the geometry tab. This is where we define what we want to cut. So it's looking for pocket selections. Don't be, don't let pocket throw you off. You could also select things such as the outside of the part. But for this operation, I want to rough just the inside of these pockets out. So I simply click on the bottom of the pocket. Those are in different depths, so you don't, have to, even though it's a 2D milling operation, you can work with pockets in different uh, planes. And I'm simply, well, one thing I want to point out on the passes tab is since that's a roughing operation, stock to leave is checked by default, and we're leaving behind 10 thousandths of material. So I'm going to right-click and OK that. It's going to run through calculating. And there we have our tool path. So um, looking at it from the home view, you can see it's going to helix down to the bottom of the pocket, well, to 10 thousandths from the bottom of the pocket, and then spiral outwards. So I get a asked a lot what high-speed um, operations are. I like to use the example of cutting grass. So traditional tool paths, you would use the full diameter of the, of the tool, and you take shallow passes and have a slow feed rate going through. It's kind of like cutting with the full deck of your lawnmower if your grass is really tall. You start with it high, move the deck down, cut it again, go low. Otherwise, you'd be bogging down the lawnmower. You'd have to slam it down and clean the grass out. Well, high-speed roughing operations were just taking a shallow pass on the side of the cutter, and we're able to push it through really quick. So that's what we're doing here. We could, and it's a constant feed and speed throughout, which saves our tool life and allows us to clean up material out quicker. So with that, that was the roughing operation. I want to come in now and 
clean out the pockets with a finishing pass. So I'm going to go to 2D Pocket to do that. But instead of um, creating a brand new operation, I'm going to carry over my pocket selections from one operation into another one. So to do that, I'm going to right click, go to straight drive to operation, 2D milling, 2D Pocket. So that carried over my tool and my pocket selection, so I'm not having to reselect those pockets. The one thing I do want to do, though, is come into my Passes tab and uncheck the box for stock to leave and turn on a finishing pass. Now, as soon as I turn on finishing pass, you notice compensation type becomes selectable. So now I can come in here and turn on my cutter compensation. And right-click and OK that. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I do that, it also carried over my entry. So before we ramped down to the bottom of the pocket, I'm going to expand. I don't want to ramp again because I'd just be cutting air and wasting time. We want to be cutting chips. So I'm going to come in and tell that to plunge. And okay that. So there we have the finishing on the inside. Now I can simply duplicate those two and do the same thing to the outside of the part. So I'm going to come in, right click, duplicate those. You can click and drag them around in the browser. So now we have um, some extra adaptive clearing and pocket operations. I will right click and edit that. Come under the geometry tab, clear that pocket selection, and I'm just going to select the outside of the part. So that carried over my tool, and you know if you made any other changes to any other tabs, those will be carried over because we duplicated that. It was changing the geometry selection. Um, on the heights tab, though, it's always a good idea to machine pass the part if you can. So I don't want it to stop at my counter selection, which is the outside of the part, because that's the top edge of this chamfer. I want to machine past the bottom of the part, so that way when I flip it over and face off the bottom, we're not left with a knife edge behind. So I'm going to change that to model bottom. And as soon as I do, you notice a plane becomes uh, in the viewing window, and you can simply click and drag this around. So I'm just going to drag that down below the part. Um, let's go with 20 thousandths. Oops, negative. 20 thousandths, and right click and OK that. <clears throat> so there's roughing of the outside, and now I want to derive those options into 2D contour for the outside as well. I copied pocket flexion, but I don't want to use pocket on the outside, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that real quick. So again, right-click, create derived operation, and come down to 2D contour. So that carried over my tool, the outside pocket selection. It also carried over my height offset for the bottom, so I don't need to redo that. Uh, one thing we can do that's kind of neat is ramp around the outside of the part, give us a nice surface finish. And let's go ahead and go to the Passes tab. Again, Passes is where we taught how we're cutting, so this is where you'd find your step over and step down and that type of information. And I'm going to turn on kind of compensation for that as well. Okay, so there's a finishing pass on the outside of the part. The uh, last thing we have left is to drill these holes out and then chamfer the edge of the part. So I'm going to come into a drilling operation, select my 152 drill bit, move to the geometry tab. So you notice the workflow is the same throughout. And you'll also notice as you get into these different options, and you hover over them, there's a lot of good tool tips in here throughout that give you a good explanation of the options for the software. But for the drilling operation, what it's looking for is hole faces. So I'm going to select one. And then there's an option here to flex frame diameter. As soon as I check the box for that, it's going to pick up all the other holes that are the same size. And another neat thing they built into the software, if you hover over a hole, instead of having to go up and measure it to try and figure out what size hole it is, if you look in the bottom left corner of my screen right now, you can see it's giving me a diameter of one eighth of an, or an eighth inch. So all I have to do is hover over holes, and it'll give you that information at the bottom while you're in the HSM software. So on the heights tab, I want to make sure that that drill bit comes all the way through the part. Right now, it's stopping at the bottom of the hole, so I'm going to check the box for drill tip to the bottom. You can see that that tool path comes all the way through now, 
And then on the cycle tab, this is where we define what type of um, cutting we're doing, whether it's tapping, drilling, boring, so on and so forth. I'm going to do deep drilling full retract. So this would be a peck drilling cycle. You can go in there and enter your pecking depth. Another neat thing about the software, anytime you want to change numbers and text boxes, you can right click on that and make it a default. So that way when you open up the software in the future, you're not having to redo those settings. So let's okay that operation. I got a few minutes left, so I'm going to kind of speed up here and do a drilling cycle with the chamfer tool to chamfer the, or to debar those holes. Again, I'm going to select the hole face or the chamfer face. It's going to pick up and realize that that is a chamfered surface with a chamfered tool, so we don't have to come in and make changes to the depth of that. It will automatically calculate that for the software. But I do want to check flexing diameter and drop it, wrap it out is what I want for the cycle type. So let's okay that one. And then the last operation I'm going to do is chamfer the edge of the part. So I'm going to use 2D contour. On the geometry tab, I want to select the bottom edge of the chamfer. Now you can, you know, sometimes you get parts from customers and you need to add a chamfer, but it wasn't modeled in there. So if you had the sharp corners, you can actually select those as well, because what they do in the software is give you a chamfer area down here. And you notice it's automatically checked because I used a chamfer tool. But you can select sharp corners and then come down to chamfer width and just enter an engagement for how far you want that tool to engage into the sharp corner to create your chamfer. They also give us a chamfer tip offset. I have a 50 thousandths um, offset in there as one of my defaults that I made. That way it slides the tool down and we're not cutting directly with the tip. The tip of the tool doesn't have that, or it will easily burn up the tool if you're cutting directly with the tip of it. So let's right click OK that. That should be all the operations for this side of the part. So the next thing I'm going to do is come in and simulate that. I'll select the setup, go into simulate. Here's where we can verify that we don't have any collisions and that we're cutting the way we want it to, the right order. We can also do a part comparison here we're going to see in a second. So as that's coming through, you can also go to the Info tab. You can see the real-time X, Y, and Z coordinates, your feeds and speeds, um, what operation it is, and it actually ran through a collision detection as well, so we have no collisions. You don't, you don't have to wait for the full simulation. It actually will ramp through and calculate that before you actually watch everything. So there's the finishing pass on the inside of the pockets. We're going to rough the outside with that adaptive clearing technology, always using climb milling. That's where you see those high-speed um, lift-ups. Here's our peck drilling cycle for the holes. On the statistics tab over here in the browser, they give us a rough estimate of the machine time. But obviously, it doesn't know what machine we're using yet, so it doesn't take into account tool changes or things of that nature. But if you do enter that information, it will take that into account as well. And you can see down here I have show part comparison checked. So as it finishes the simulation, you notice the part just changed colors. So what this show part comparison is, is it allows us to verify the model versus what we actually added for operations. So gray is good. That means we machined down to the surface. If it was, if there was any blue left behind, like we see here, that means there's still some stock to leave behind or to rough out or to cut out. And on the info tab, I can actually hover over any surface, and you can see here in the distance box, as I hover over areas, it's telling me that zero inches. That means we have cut the part down to that surface. So if I hover over this blue over here, we're going to see there's still 200,000 so material to remove there. So good for verification. Once we do that, we can also do a setup sheet. I'm going to select the setup here. This will open up in your web browser. It's a neat um, breakdown of all of your operations that you can hand to the uh, operator for your CNC equipment. It gives you the file, the size of the stock to load, the name of the operation, and what tools to load in the what tool holder. So good information there. And now we're ready to post this out. So as I mentioned, uh, this is all integrated. So let's say the customer calls up and says that they want to make a change to the part. Well, since this is CAD and CAM, all I have to do is double-click that part file. 
and I had it open on our window, so it actually jumped windows. Let me just close that real quick and do that again. So I'll double click that part. We can edit it in place. Um, I'm going to come in and make this part three and a half inches. And let's change the number of holes I have. So edit that pattern. Let's do three instead of five. So it's going to change the shape of the pocket and the number of holes. So once we do that, I'm going to finish the edit. It's going to jump back into the cam tab. You notice that I got a bunch of red X's here in the browser. And I actually had my part linked to the soft jaws that I have here, so those also updated for me. But all I need to do to regenerate those toolpaths is select setup and generate. And it's going to go through and regenerate those toolpaths to my new geometry. So as you can see here, all of those toolpaths are now updated to my new model size. And now we can post that out. So we're going to go into post processing. And I got a generic house. There's 80, I think, five different post processors in there. We also do those. Uh, we can make any edits that you might need if we don't have one that fits your needs in there. And there's some changes you can make down here. Um, if you have like a swing arm or an umbrella style tool changer, you can tell it whether to preload the tool or not. And those are sticky, so if you make changes there, they'll stay there for you. So let's go ahead and post that out. And it opens up into the HSM editor. So we have color-coded high-speed movements, tool changes, things of that nature. You can jump around from tool to tool using these navigation tools. You can also come in and backplot and run a simulation of the part off the G-code as well. So I'm just holding the down arrow here, and you can run through that. So really good post-process editor. So with that, uh, hopefully you guys picked up some tips or tricks here in this webinar. If you have any questions for me, um, I have your information from the attendees that joined the webinar, so I will shoot out an email with my contact information for you guys. If you need to get a hold of me, uh, please do. And have a good day and a good weekend. Thanks, guys.